Uh, can you hear? We give it just a moment for people to arrive. Uh, I start screen sharing and we kick off in a minute. Um, <laughs> so now I can't see how many we are, but maybe I I kick in. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Andreas Lang. I'm the course leader of the MA in Architecture at Central St. Martins and also the Knowledge Exchange Lead for Placemaking across CSM. Uh, uh, welcome to the third of the Forest Talks. Today's topic is regenerative design. Uh, uh, we have two wonderful guests, uh, and this works. Uh, exploring that term, regenerative design, it's the term regenerative seems to be popping up everywhere from economies to agriculture. And I'm really pleased that we have two, um, two wonderful speakers who will kind of highlight that term and uh, dissect it, what it means within the architectural discourse, but also beyond. Um, um, just very quickly to point you towards our website, we have, um, we're collecting all the work that's going on in and around the forest school uh, on a website, which is a Padlet, which also will hold, um, will hold this talk, the recording of this talk and has a recording of the previous talks. The forest school for us at CSM is, a, is an open platform through which to start addressing the climate crisis and biodiversity loss. And start the journey within a living system uh, or using, in a way, the prism of the forest to, to really interrogate what approaches we can take towards the climate crisis. So regenerative design might not speak directly about the forest, but it speaks into the forest in some way. Um, so sometimes the links are quite lateral. We also use this project to commission work and start research. So uh, in previous iterations, we had a radio segment to see us out and we have uh, a graduate um, um, producing a news item for numerous reasons that doesn't happen today, but they will be back in the next session. And uh, also on top of um, this work, we, we're starting to enter some research projects, which we'll probably highlight later on. Um, so today's talk um, is, uh, oh yeah, you can subscribe to our mailing list there. Don't, don't forget to get more mail. Maybe to say this is of course a lecture and a talk, but it's also in the spirit of a school. Uh, we've invited our students to prepare um, questions, but it's also maybe to, to open that space that no question is too obvious. Uh, so feel free to ask freely. Doesn't matter where you are within the discourse, it's really appreciated to have that conversation and we left enough room for Q&A today. So um, the series is a collaboration uh, with White Architecture in Malmö in Sweden. So welcome to you who are kindly supporting it, but it's also about building a longer term conversation and partnership with them and also with Forestry England, um, who will be co-curating the second part of the season uh, more, more intensely, uh, which starts in April. So today's speakers are Sarah Gioka and Michael Paulin, who have just published a wonderful book called Flourish. And this is a very good um, moment to talk about the kind of extensive work they have done in that field. And the session will be hosted by Carole Collette, who is um, Professor for Sustainable Futures here at Central St. Martins. And among many other things and many other roles has also just uh, written a new course at CSM called Regenerative Design. So I thank you all for being here. I um, will turn myself off and hand over to Carol. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Andreas, and welcome everybody. We are delighted to have all of you on board. Um, so I will start with a very brief introduction to the theme and the topic before I leave the floor to our uh, champions of regenerative practice, uh, Michael and Sarah. They will be speaking for about 15 minutes and then we will have time for Q&A. 
So I would like to encourage you to pop your question in the chat as we go through the presentations, but we will take them at the end. And what I will be doing is I'll be reading the questions and inviting Michael and Sarah to respond. So to introduce this talk, I think it, it's really important to think that about, you know, we talk a lot about the climate emergency, the planetary emergency and the need for a system reset. Um, but to talk about it is one thing, to do it is another. And we have with us today two guests who are doing it, not just talking about it or writing about it. So we really want to learn from them. Um, we at Central St. Martins and University of the Arts have declared a climate emergency several years ago now. We're in the midst of a profound transformation. We're re looking at our structures. We're re looking at our curriculum. We are developing new curriculum because we cannot transition to better design alternatives if we don't also completely recalibrate our educational models in architecture and design. So how do we reimagine architectural practice in a context of a planetary emergency? That's a really key question for us. How do we integrate multi-species thinking in our creative process? So we've looked at these questions very much when, when launching the new masters in regenerative design. We really want, our mission is to really help designers moving beyond neutral, beyond less impact into a space where we can use design as an act of repair, an act of restoration and an act of care. So for this, we need new frameworks, we need new tools, we need also a complete set of, of new words, new languages. We need to go beyond that technocratic, um, you know, net zero, carbon neutral. It's really not inspirational for creatives. And I think we need to really look at a language that's informed by nature. So the notion of abundance, interconnectedness, and the notion of flourishing in a more than human world. And, and I think for me, I really love the title of, of your new book, Michael and Sarah, because it starts to open up a complete different imaginary of what we can produce in the future. So I very much hope you'll, you'll be commenting on the, on the title and the language you're using in, in, your, in your book as well. Uh, briefly, for those who don't know, but I'm pretty sure you do know, um, Michael Paulin is an architect who set up Exploration Architecture back in 2007, and who is a pioneer of biomimicry and regenerative uh, principles in, in architecture. Sarah Ichoka is a strategist, an urbanist, a writer, a curator who leads on the design consultancy design lines and, and who's um, uh, world renowned for her contribution. Um, I will be asking them perhaps to start the talk by telling us why did you come together to collaborate on this book uh, before you start presenting your, your concepts. So the floor is yours. Thanks again for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Michael. Do you want to do you want to talk about the collaboration or shall I? I'm very happy for you to do it, Sarah, and I'll, I'll just chip in if I think there's anything key you've, you've All right. missed. Brilliant. Okay. So thanks so much to Andreas for the original invitation um, to the Central St. Martin's community for hosting us, uh, Carol to, for moderating and setting, setting us up already for a flourishing uh, discourse, and to Joy for all of her fantastic coordination behind the scenes. Um, before we get into the meat of our talk, or a um, regenerative alternative to the word neat. Um, let's see, Michael and I, um, Flourish is really the result of three years of collaboration, um, but that itself built on over a decade of um, professional friendship um, that's just, I guess, progressively deepened. We first met when we were both uh, working in London and um, I was really happy. The last exhibition that my team curated before I left the Architecture Foundation to relocate to Asia, um, the last exhibition that we hosted was the first ever um, international retrospective of Michael's studio's work. Um, and then, yeah, we've just stayed in touch and um, would always compare notes on where we were uh, in terms of our practice and our thinking. And, I think our, the, the seed for uh, writing the book came with a series of events in 2018 that I won't dwell on now, but we describe in the book and have in other talks. Um, or basically, we came to realize as, as so many of our respected peers on this call and um, who we cite in the book that sustainability is completely insufficient as a paradigm to deal with all of our compound and anthropogenic crises. So, um, but it's been a wonderful collaboration and 
looking forward to the conversation. Um, as Andreas has helpfully mentioned, um, Flourish is now out from Triarchy Press. Um, we can drop the links um, if you want to order a copy or ask your uh, local library to procure a copy in the chat now. As um, Andreas and Carol have both mentioned, it's been really heartening uh, to see how swiftly the use of the term regenerative has come into uh, professional discourse over the last three years or so that Michael and I have been working on Flourish. And a lot of that credit is due to work by amazing regenerative thinkers and practitioners like Kate Rayworth, like Daniel Val, um, and many others who've been making a compelling case for the need for regenerative thinking and practice. However, for designers, we believe that there's still a lack of clarity of what regenerative actually means. And so in Flourish, our book, we've set out to clarify that. It, you know, For starters, it's a lot more than sustainability with all the knobs turned up. It really involves fundamental changes of mindset. And we outline five of these mindsets or paradigms in the book. Uh, for, for more of our thinking about the general purpose and structure of the book, we would warmly invite you to watch the talk that we gave last month at the RSA, and we'll, we'll drop the link for that in the chat as well. Um, but in general, we could say the vast majority of what we've been, we, collectively have been doing under the paradigm of sustainability has entailed doing less harm rather than actually improving already extremely degraded and unjust conditions, and has therefore unfortunately been part of what we could call a degenerative cycle. This has been a painful realization for Michael, for me, for many others that we respect. You know, we, we all thought that we were making things better, but actually we've been stuck in this realm of mitigating negatives, only making things less bad. Uh, the challenge, of course, now, which is why we're all on this call together, is how do we get into the realm of truly regenerative design? And, and just as we debated for decades what the ultimate in sustainability is now, we now need a vigorous debate that's really grounded in practice about what the ultimate in regenerative design should be. And the ultimate, Michael and I believe, is that we need to get to the point where we as designers, as commissioners of design, um, are participating and co-evolving as an integrated part of nature. And so we want to focus today on just one of these five paradigm shifts, which is designing as nature. The way that we see the world, our, our prevailing worldview, has a tremendous influence on the way we behave as societies. And one of the books that's most inspired us at uh, bringing together a very clear um, articulation of this thinking is the book, The Patterning Instinct by Jeremy Lent. And in Patterning Instinct, Lent describes the rise of dualism, you know, the idea that humans, that we as humans are separate from nature. And Lent traces this through multiple strands, but largely to the philosophy of Francis Bacon and Rene Descartes, who viewed nature as a machine and as something to be conquered. The problem we now face is that this conquest of nature worldview completely dominates our culture in the rich industrialized world. You know, whether consciously or not, our main economic systems treat nature as an externality or, you know, at best as a service provider. It's something that's separate from us and it's something that's uh, ready to be plundered uh, for resources. Again, even, even the word resources, right, suggests that separate relationship. We believe that the way humans see our relationship with nature will be critical to our species' future prospects and that should also shape our purpose as practicing designers or clients of design. And we believe that addressing the multiple environmental crises of the present moment will require us to completely rethink our position and role on Earth. So what would a non-dualistic view look like? Well, 
We think the, the first thing to realize is that the boundaries of us as individual organisms are not as clear as we perhaps once thought. So within our bodies, our human cells are outnumbered 10 to 1 by microbial cells. So we're actually superorganisms rather than organisms. And all of our cells are dependent on other living systems for oxygen and water and nutrients. So it's scientifically inaccurate to regard ourselves as isolated individuals. Of course, this is not a new perspective. Indigenous peoples have had this view for thousands of years. So it's mainly the last 400 years of Western societies that may come to be seen as an aberration in planetary development. Our challenge now is to integrate all human activities into the web of life that supports us. How do we do this? Firstly, we need to develop a greater understanding of complex systems. Planet Earth has evolved into a set of nested systems across a range of scales from a cell up to a vast bioregion. We can learn a lot about rethinking our cities by looking at the characteristics of ecosystems. Conventional human-made systems are generally linear, wasteful, disconnected, running on fossil fuels, and importantly, they're extractive. By contrast, biological systems are cyclical, symbiotic, interconnected, run on solar energy, and they're regenerative to their place. So that's a very brief description of the systems view that we give in the book. And there are a number of other implications to that. So firstly, it radically changes the materials that we should be using. 96% of all living matter is made from just four elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. And nearly all of the remaining 4% comes from a further seven elements. So the living world uses a safe, subset of the periodic table. By contrast, humans use nearly every element of that periodic table, including some that are really deeply problematic. So we need to radically rethink the way we make things. And if we shift towards biomaterials, there's a real possibility that we could achieve factor 10 or 100 savings in energy, as well as making it easier to steward resources in closed loop cycles. The practice of biomimicry has a mixed reputation amongst architects. And I think that's because a lot of what has been described as biomimicry has been quite super, superficial based on copying natural forms and so on. And actually we, we set out in the book a, a much more profound basis for biomimicry. So as a subject, it, it first reached a broad audience with the publication of Janine Benius's book, Biomimicry, Desi Design Inspired by Nature. That was in 1997. Although the term first appeared in scientific literature some decades previously in 1962, and arguably represents a continuation of the idea manifest in indigenous cultures that humans can adapt and evolve as nature. Benius describes biomimicry as a discipline that is based not on what we can extract from the natural world, but on what we can learn from it. At its best, Biomimicry is a synthesis of the age-old human potential for innovation, coupled with the best that contemporary science can offer. This synthesis exceeds the power of either alone. Many architects talk about philosophers like Foucault and Derrida and Deleuze, but for us, looking for teachings that are useful in the context of our planetary emergency, we believe we should be much more familiar as a profession with a philosopher called Freya Matthews. Freya Matthews is an environmental philosopher whose current special interests are in ecological civilization, comparative indigenous, Western, and Chinese perspectives on environmentalism, and how these perspectives may be adapted to the context of contemporary global society. Freya Matthews explores some of the shortcomings of biomimicry as currently practiced, and the crucial question of whether biomimicry is to be directed towards human-focused or bio-inclusive ends. Matthews uses bio-inclusive to describe approaches that encompass the vast, if diminished, array of other species with which we humans share planet Earth. Janine Benius describes the core principles of biomimicry as being Nature runs on sunlight and uses only the energy it needs. It fits form to function, recycles everything, rewards cooperation, and banks on diversity. 
It demands local expertise, curbs excesses from within and taps the power of limits. While it's clear that Benius is firmly in the bio-inclusive camp, there is little in the principles that would prevent biomimicry from being used to serve purely human-focused ends by simply rendering existing human activities more efficient and without questioning whether those activities are of benefit to nature as a web of systems. There is, in Frey Matthews' judgment, a fatal ambiguity at the heart of, of biomimicry about the notion of my sorry, about the notion of mimicry that could, depending on how it is adopted, lead us in a disastrous or ideal direction. For instance, she writes about how such a system could entirely displace and replace original nature with a human-made second nature, an engineered planetary simulacrum of nature created to service our own needs exclusively and being designed after nature. On the other hand, However, my, by, mimicry might be read as pointing towards a schema that imitates original nature in the sense that it works towards the ecological reintegration of humanity back into the larger community of life, following the synergistic patterns set by other species. This would represent a sustainable outcome, not only in the sense of sustaining human civilization, but in the sense of sustaining all of Earth life. Matthews illustrates a human-focused interpretation of biomimicry by analyzing the Eco-Modernist Manifesto, published in 2015 by the Breakthrough Institute, a research center that describes itself as identifying and promoting technological solutions to environmental and human development challenges. That manifesto endorses the idea of decoupling, decoupling industrial systems so that they run on clean energy and produce no waste by employing closed loop resource use. It also proposes setting aside areas of land for rewilding and urges people to reconnect with the natural environment. Matthews argues that in the absence of any firm commitment to bio-inclusivity, it's unrealistic to imagine that the land set aside for rewilding will not be explo exploited to satisfy further human consumption, especially given that the eco-modernists are dismissive of limits to growth, as, as described by Tinella Meadows et al. in the renowned report commissioned by the Club of Rome in 1972. In Towards the Deeper Philosophy of Biomimicry, published in 2011, Freya Matthews asserts that biomimicry has moved us closer to the goal of planetary ecological integrity, closer than the traditional environmental movement ever did. But she identifies two important principles that are necessary for the discipline to achieve a more profound level of engagement by humans with the rest of nature. And those, those two principles are conativity and least resistance. Conativity refers to the impulse for all living beings and living systems to maintain and increase their own existence. The principle of least resistance describes the manner in which they pursue their connectivity. They do so in a way that involves the least expenditure of effort on their part. It's important to distinguish the latter from a mechanistic view of systems that might seek to extract the maximum output from any given input. We understand that Matthews alludes more to the way that organisms and systems have evolved to optimize energy and resource use over time. So an ecosystem that was able to thrive with less effort was more likely to endure. Connectivity and least resistance are deeply intertwined. And she writes, the most effective way of preserving one's own existence is to weave one's own connective ends into the connective goals of others. By making oneself integral to the existence of others, one induces them to do at least part of the work of preserving one's own existence, thereby further conserving one's own energy. The two principles are beautifully orchestrated in living systems and are particularly exquisitely exemplified in stable ecosystems. As beings who are able to reflect on what we perceive, humans can choose how we wish to relate to nature. The dominant behavioral norm in agrarian societies since their rise has been to not engage with the connectivity of living systems. The rise of settler agriculture involved creating an exclusively human-centric space cleared of the ecosystems that once thrived there, and nature became largely a backdrop 
rather than something in which humans could be constructively involved, i.e. enhancing the connectivity of those living systems. This cultivated a mindset that produced buildings that were increasingly detached from the web of surrounding systems, first separated by a fence, then enclosed against the elements, and as the technology developed, built with materials increasingly transported from distant origins. It also produced a mindset that would, in the 20th century, see nothing wrong with transporting nutrients to and from the site over vast distances, and pursuing an architectural aesthetic indistinguishable from that found in other totally different locations. Arguably, one of the greatest flaws of modernism was its universalization of culture, which proved so destructive to the distinctiveness of places. Matthews observes that the shift to agrarian societies was an epochal moment, but the blunt distinction between hunter-gatherer and farmer has occluded another important practice, which was, and for many people remains, an important part of their culture and cognition. Numerous indigenous peoples have practiced what Matthews refers to as custodialism, which involves actively managing an ecosystem to partly serve human ends while still allowing it to realize its own connectivity. Aboriginal people of Australia, for instance, actively manage the landscapes and waterways they live, live in to suit favored herbivores and particular native plants without the full transition to the removal of ecosystems inherent in agrarian societies. The praxis of custodialism, in Matthew's words, often referred to by others as stewardship or guardianship in North American terminology, reveals the important possibility of humans neither being subsumed into nature, as some proponents of deep ecology advocate, nor being completely separated, but instead being able to participate as part of nature. So to make sure we're communicating clearly, we're not advocating a return to pre-agrarian civilization. Um, instead, we're interested in thinking about human cultures and in particular designers can shift our patterns of thinking so that we become active participants in the web of natural systems. The potential exists for us humans to reach a state of co-evolution as nature in which the co-nativities of humans and other living systems are jointly served. Matthews argues that this distinction is crucial to further development of biomimicry so that it serves bio-inclusive rather than purely human-focused ends. It will evolve, in her words, imitating nature, not in its particulars, but in its deepest logic. Other thinkers, of course, have offered related terms for this dynamic, such as scientist Robin Wall Kimmerer's term, mutual flourishing. Uh, Bill McDonough advocates a new approach to design such that all so-called waste becomes food, um, either in the form of biological nutrients for living systems or feedstuffs for technological remanufacturing without the loss of material quality. These are standard principles now of a circular economy. As an example, McDonough proposes that a hair gel manufacturer should ask themselves, what does the river that this will end up in want from the hair gel? Uh, while acknowledging that McDonough's thinking is on the right lines, Matthews asserts the need to go a significant step further. Um, as she puts it, the question needs to be asked, that needs to be asked is not merely what byproduct does the river want from the commodities that we desire, but what does the river want us to desire in the first place? What contribution does it need us to make if it is to attain its own creative unfolding? So designers, everyone on this call perhaps, should no longer think about how to minimize impact, but rather to think within a regenerative paradigm of how to make a positive impact and contribute to the connativity of the living systems of which we are a part. What does nature want us to do? Will undoubtedly be a challenging question for designers. Does this mean that buildings should be completely self-effacing and try to hide themselves in the landscape? No, no, no. Bio-inclusive architecture could be every bit as spectacular as a peacock or as a bird of paradise flower. It could even, like a beaver, bring a new landscape into being of which the structure's construction is a vital part. So we're not simply advocating the direct mimicking of natural forms, 
um, which you could think of as biomorphic design, but we're appealing instead for a deeper understanding of biomimicry as a functional discipline and a celebratory approach to maximizing our connectivity. Should this entail humanity surrendering to nature? No, we're, we're talking about a new relationship with the rest of the living world. And just like a love affair or a close friendship with another person or fantastic intercontinental collaboration on a book over three years. Um, it doesn't have to involve one party winning or losing. Um, on the contrary, it's an opportunity to enhance identity in a realm of limitless depth and beauty. Sounds exciting to me. Um, but we're looking forward to continuing the conversation and learning to, about how this thinking relates to the other work that everyone at the Forest School is doing. Brilliant. Thank you so much. This is music to my ear. <laughs> um, really, really inspirational. Um, before we start formally the Q&A, can I remind everybody you can pop your question in the chat. Um, we have a few questions already from two people who, unfortunately, I think I've had to leave already from uh, Jeremy Till, who's our head of college, and uh, from Shumi Bose. I will start with that question. I have quite a few questions myself as well, but can I please encourage um, anybody attending to pop more questions? Um, so Jeremy is asking, great introduction, thanks. Um, question is, should our identification of spatial practices with natural systems be conceptual, literal, analogical, or metaphorical, or a combination of all these depending on context? I'm happy to have a go at that first and then Sarah can chip in. So yeah, it's a great question. And I, I think it can involve all of those. Um, so for instance, uh, one really promising area of regenerative design uh, that in our view is much underexplored is the idea of applying ecosystems principles to human-made systems such as industrial systems or particularly cities and so the aim there is is to try and uh, get the human-made system to function much more like a, 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 an ecosystem to follow the characteristics of ecosystems so whereas human-made systems tend to be linear, monofunctional, disconnected, and running on fossil fuels. Ecosystems are densely interconnected, symbiotic, run on solar energy, and they're, they're regenerative. And so um, that can be done on a, quite a sort of metaphorical level, but actually you can go further and, and get more scientific about it. So that there's, a, there's a group at uh, Georgia Tech We've actually applied scientific principles to, to a, an, an analysis of some of these projects. They're called eco-industrial parks, where, where they've tested out these symbiotic um, um, ideas. And by actually getting more scientific in our understanding of ecosystems, they've argued that we could push the um, benefits and re regenerative enhancements even further. Sarah, maybe you want to add. No, I think that sums it up really well. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm really glad that Michael shared that example because obviously when these flashes, we do need the metaphorical shift as well, right? That we, we need the overall framing of how we think about these things uh, to fundamentally change. But also, you know, we've been really happy to be able to include lots of specific examples of um, designers and clients of design interacting uh, in a practical way with natural systems as well. And uh, Carol, you mentioned at the beginning the importance of language. And um, that really is something that I think um, at a sort of academic level has only uh, really become um, general knowledge, I guess, uh, with the work of cognitive neuroscientists like uh, George Lakoff, who've shown pretty, pretty conclusively that the kind of metaphors we hold um, and our world views, the way we, you know, the world, the way we look at the world, actually has a, a huge and previously largely underappreciated impact on the way we behave, either as individuals or at a societal level. And so, if you if you have a metaphor of um, conquest of nature, as Francis Bacon advocated, then that leads to very different practices. To if you have a metaphor of humans as embedded within a web of systems, as Jeremy Lent argues we should have. 
If I could add one more point to that, I think that it's important not to think of the things as separated. Actually, like the way Jeremy presented it, it sounds like they're like they're separate things, but actually interaction with natural systems, like intimate interaction with internet with natural systems will provide us with essential new metaphors that we also need to navigate the world. And I think that that's, um, you know, that's one of the major losses that we've had from an kind of urbanization that doesn't include co-native practices with natural systems is that we, when we lose the access to those other natural systems, not only are we and they diminished by that um, functionally, but we also, in terms of our, our potentials to imagine new futures that aren't drawn from, you know, stock stereotypes based on a few select species we might interact with um, in a very dominant way, I think it is also that, that's that's a tremendous area of rediscovery that we can engage with. I think this is um really exciting and I think this is a kind of discourse we need to hear about how do we rethink not just architectural practice but how we teach architecture uh, which of course Andreas and I are, are very interested in. Um, I ran a workshop a few years ago in our BA architecture about how to adopt this living system thinking into our creative practice and after doing the workshop one of the students said but why are we learning about modernism? surely we're learning about the wrong things. And I said, well, yeah, probably, <laughs> because I really think we should integrate ecology in every creative education. So, uh, and we had a conversation with Andreas recently, I just said, you know, every architect should know what a traffic cascade is. They need to understand how their architectural propositions will disrupt primary producers, secondary, um, you know, I, I think this is really key. And, and I think, Michael, you do that. You bring ecologists on boards when you develop your actual you know, architectural practice. But what I really am interested in is, is two questions, is really what is the ambition of architecture in a sort of post-anthropocentric world? But the second question is really pragmatic, is how do you start an architectural project to when you want to embed these living system thinking and these regenerative principles. I mean, where do you start? How do you start? Could you be give us some really practical tips and tools so that we can facilitate and accelerate that transition? Because the theoretical underpinning is clear, it's inspirational, it's visionary. We, you know, I think very much believe in this. But the trick is always okay, but you're in front of this, you know, white sheet of paper, you're going to, how do I even begin? So if, you, if you're given a new brief, if you have a new client, how do you begin the brief so that you can integrate this design as nature principle at the core of your proposition? Can I answer the first? And because I'm not an architect, I might let Michael <laughs> answer the, what is the purpose of architecture question? And um, so as, as we write in the book, um, we think one of the key regenerative questions that designers or clients of design should ask themselves at the start of any um, spatial intervention is uh, what solutions already exist in this place. And we see that as a fully integrated complement of um, natural systems and cultural systems, which you can see as a clear integrated subset of natural systems if you're thinking in this new way. Um, and, and that there has, it, so it, essentially the first step is moving away from the idea that there is a blank sheet of paper <laughs> when you're starting a project, right? It's not you making a mark in your notebook, it's you like going out with your notebook and other experts, you know, you mentioned Michael works collaboratively with ecologists. Um, I think we make we make a long case for, uh, you know, a, a case through some of the projects we feature for um, the, the power of interdisciplinary teams, for sure, um, of, of disciplinarily diverse teams. So go out with the people who know how to either read the land as it currently is, 
um, understand historical documentations of um, eco, you know, ecosystem functioning or um, cultural practices, indigenous or traditional cultural practices. And I think that that can be, a, you know, rather than starting with the like, that trope of, oh, look, it's a fabric of textile. Yeah, sorry, it, it's, a, it's a fragment of textile. Let's make a pattern of the facade that reflects that. I mean, there, there are many, many deeper ways to explore and learn from and be inspired uh, by precedents from living systems on site. Yeah, so um, Carol, you alluded to such an important question there. You know, what, what is our purpose? And uh, it's something that Sarah and I have, have thought about a lot during the writing of this book. And I would encourage everyone to think about that. And our, our conclusion in the book is that uh, our purpose as, as architects and built environment professionals is to support the flourishing of all life for all time. And um, you know, sometimes when I look at design and see some things that are very different to my approach, I, 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 wonder, I wonder how that architect actually sees their purpose. And Sometimes it's good to take a, a deep time perspective as well. So we refer to Brian Eno quite a bit in the book, and, and he, he encourages people to think about what, what is your long-term purpose? And by that, he means not just sort of 10 years, but what, what difference might you make long after you're gone? Because that's worth thinking about now so that you, you spend your time uh, uh, wisely. And adding to what Sarah was saying there about um, you know, the really important question when you approach a site is to, to ask what solutions already exist in this place. And to some extent, this is picking up on Andreas's question as well. Uh, so we think there is a good case for developing a deeper and broader understanding of place and also bringing ingenuity to the materials and opportunities that exist on a site. So rather than bringing loads of materials to a site, if you bring ingenuity to the site and some people get a bit um, apprehensive about anything that sounds um, uh, about uh, sounds as to do with localizing, and I think there is an important distinction here between uh, different types of resources. And so, what we're advocating is localizing physical resource use and globalizing intellectual resources. So, for instance, you know, bamboo exists in in just about every tropical climate, um, and that can be used as a very good local material. And we can share the knowledge of that all around the world. We could globalize what, what we learn from how to, to use that. Um, yes, I think that was all I was going to say on that one. But I mean, that's interesting with it. So this is, you know, the design of architecture. But the building of architecture is also problematic when you think about materials, because it's, it's a fairly risk adverse industry. You know, you can't introduce a brand new type of material because builders might go like, well, I don't really know how this works. You know, I don't want the liability. You know, who's going to pay for insurance if it doesn't survive in 20 years time? So how do you translate the, these brilliant notions of regenerative principles, living system thinking, but in a way that actually can be adopted in a risk adverse context? Um, and I think I want to pick back on, on Pervisha's question. So we're talking about architecture. He's also talking about, you know, the, the, at city scale, how we can we can we bring this regenerative living system thinking? So um, to answer the first question, I think this is where the longer time perspective is very helpful. And I warmly invite everyone to listen to our interview with the amazing deep time philosopher Roman Krasnarich, which will be broadcast uh, tomorrow. Um, and he talks about how a lot of exercises um, that, that partners like the Long Time Project um, have, implemented, have created um, on the basis of works by amazing people like Joanna Macy that help all of us to consider this longer time perspective. Um, and especially at this, that, that golden start to a project phase, um, I think an exercise that helps us reframe risk at this moment would be, is long overdue actually, because I mean, what greater risk do we all face right now than ecological collapse, right? So that's, I think, um, well, thanks for sharing. For sure, um, we'd love to hear what everyone, the Forest School community, thinks about um, thinks about our conversation with Roman. Um, 
but I just I just think already if we can use our agency as um, project leads or at least you know project um, contributors with an active voice to help people reframe their understanding of what is at stake in a particular project. Um, that's already a very helpful intervention that avoids getting caught up um, in all of those small details that can easily derail a project. Michael, do you want to add something? Yeah, sure. So, um, Carol, you're absolutely right that it, it can be challenging um, doing innovative stuff in, in the built environment. And really, we should have a, a much um, more vibrant um, research program um, you know, as, as an industry. Um, I mean, that's not to say that it, it can't be done, that, you know, there are ways of, of researching projects and um, there is a, a fairly well-established kind of trajectory of innovation. And so often it's best to start with something very small, maybe a piece of furniture, and then move from that to a temporary pavilion, which is easier in terms of legislation and, and insurance. And then the next step would be a, a fairly simple enclosure. So I would count the, the Eden Project biomes as, as an example of that. Um, and then eventually you can get through to a, to a really complex building. And so if you're trying something really innovative, it is worth thinking about that as a, as a kind of trajectory rather than to try and go straight to applying it on a complex building. And I just quickly um, pipe in, sorry. I, I, I just know that I love how you refer to the forest school community. Sarah, you're the first person to take it so serious. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm, I'm aware that our students have prepared some questions. I've done some research. So and looking at the time, they're 10 minutes, and I know they're always shy, but I'm just an encouragement to, to make your voice heard while we have time. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. And also just to say, Andreas, like I know sometimes you get the esprit de, esprit de l'escalier where you, you know, you remember the key question after. Um, so we're also, Michael and I are also pretty active on Twitter and LinkedIn. So we're really happy to respond to questions there too, if people reach out to us. Um, I, I, I dropped it in the chat, but I think that also in response to Carol's uh, question, you know, Carol, I was so excited when you were talking about this opportunity to completely rethink CSM's systems. And, and it seems to me that, uh, you know, such a prestigious, Institute of Higher Education has a really key role to play in facilitating this sort of innovation that makes it perhaps makes it safer and it creates a safer space for experimentation, but under the aegis and, um, you know, of, of a trusted institutional brand, for lack of a better word. And so maybe there's maybe there's a great role for you to play, too. Well, that's what we're trying to do, and <laughs> Andreas is trying to do with the Forest School. Um, just to quickly, we've got a few more minutes, but so Henry, you're asking about case studies, read the book, <laughs> it's all in there. Um, and actually, Andreas, I haven't checked if it's in our library yet, hopefully it is already in the library, uh, but we will make sure that we have enough copies in our library. Uh, but also reference back to previous book from Michael, the bar mimicry book in architecture. And, and that echoes uh, what Giovanni uh, discusses in his comment on, you know, bar mimicries. And I'm glad you made that, that clarity, Michael, because I have also experienced talking to architects about bar mimicry who literally laughed in my face because they thought it was just a matter of, you know, imitating a shape or planting a few trees on a roof. And, and that's a radical misunderstanding of what bar mimicry is. So um, I think this, you know, go, going back to the language issue is um, this whole notion of regenerative practice, I think is quite empowering, it's quite a, a, a powerful metaphor. But there's already, and I can see that in other sector, not just in, in, actually not so much in architecture, but I can see that in fashion a lot. Um, everybody's moving on that term as a replacement for sustainable design. It's the new kind of hype world. You know, we've we've talked a lot about circular design, circular. Now it's about oh, regenerative design. But I see a lot of people using that term simply to replace what they mean by sustainability. So, you know, how do we how do we kind of get away from this greenwashing, which is this sort of, you know, our materialist culture constantly reproposes meaningful concept into sometimes uh, greenwashing concepts. Um, mm. 
in the field of architecture, which is really your expertise, you know, do you feel the term regenerative is understood or is it a really emergent term? Yeah, we, um, we do address this in the introduction actually, and we're cautiously optimistic that regenerative will prove to be a more robust term than sustainable. And the reason for that is that sustainable came to mean kind of anything that was an improvement on uh, the old way of doing things, kind of. And so all sorts of things that were actually quite um, degenerative in the sense of making things worse were described as sustainable. But I think um, people who use the term regenerative and can't demonstrate in some convincing way that it is having a net positive impact, they, um, you know, they, they, they're um, running the risk of being seriously criticized, and I actually hope they will. So I, you know, I, I hope regenerative will come to mean having a net positive Im impact. Um, and I think that is a really significant shift in, in language from sustainable. Sarah, you, you want to say something? Yes, uh, building on that, I think that it, um, I think, Carol, you're absolutely right. And greenwashing is rife, right? We see it across industries. Um, and it's a very real, it's a very real risk. But I think that's one of the reasons that Michael that um, it accelerated Michael and my coming together for this book is feeling that there's this opportunity as this novel vocabulary becomes, it comes into broader use for us to more clearly define terms and then move beyond terms to actually practicing in that way. Um, in a demonstrable way. So we, you know, we did quite a lot of research and charted kind of the slow degeneration of the use of sustainability. And I think, you know, Carol, you're coming up with a new regenerative design course or architecture course at CSM. Um, you know, this book, we, we, we're really trying to articulate clearly what, you know, our, we, we can debate our terms, but at least if we don't just don't just use the term, but actually define what each of us mean. You know, what is what is regenerative teaching mean in a CSM context? There is a, there is a window of opportunity to be more precise and to be more accountable about it. That that also brings the issue of time, because if you're looking at designing spatial practices to let's say repair a biodiversity or bio specific biosphere. It takes time to replenish biodiversity. So you may have delivered a project, but the actual regenerative impact might be fully you know, appreciated only 10, 20, 30, 100 years later. So how do we make that visible to the client? You know, that, yeah, you're gonna to have to wait for 10, 20 years before you've actually, you can see the impact of this. How, how do you convince your client it's worth investing in that type of practice, even though it could take time. I think it, it can take time, but you know, we um, if you go to our Instagram page, you can see we've recently featured an exploration architecture project in Qatar, um, which you know restored this amazing kind of flourishing of flora and fauna uh, around the architectural project. And I think Michael, I mean, you were able to begin to document some of the return to species to that site in a matter of weeks, months. And um, so it's, uh, I think that you can, and similarly with the social aspects of regeneration, right? Like you can see whether a project is harming its community or not. You know, you, you may not see the full reparations or restorations of past harms, but you can certainly see if it begins to generate right livelihoods in a community. Am I right about timing on that on that project, Michael? Yeah, yeah, we we started to see the difference very quickly, and you know, yeah. in just eight months, we achieved a hell of a lot. And um, picking this up is on the Sahara project, not everybody yes. knew of this. I yes, know sorry, yeah. at Santa Rosa Martins a few years yeah. ago, but not everybody was here. Maybe you want to explain? Yeah, yeah. so it, it, this was uh, one of the versions that we built of the Sahara Forest Project, which brings together a cluster of synergistic technologies in desert regions to produce food and energy while also regenerating um, deserts. And uh, picking up on what you were saying there about timescales, Carol, we've got a whole chapter on time, which encourages people to think 
over a much longer and deeper uh, scale of time. And um, we're convinced that that is another really important dimension to regenerative design, because you know, if you think of a, a fairly common way of, of considering biodiversity within a sustainable framing, you might look at what exists on a site and try and conserve what's there or maybe even enhance it a little bit. But a regenerative uh, perspective would involve developing a deep time understanding um, and sometimes even looking at paleoecological records to establish what species are missing. Um, and you know, this is, of course, the basis of rewilding and, and so on. And um, we we write uh, quite um, kind of excitedly in a way about the, the uh, possibility that shifting baseline syndrome could start to shift in the other way. So shifting baseline syndrome is the idea that we all tend to accept the level of biodiversity that we grow up with as what's normal. But in reality, it's often really diminished. Yeah. You know, the, the abundance that used to exist just 200 years ago, say, is way more. And, and there's a very real possibility that we could get back to that if we go about it the right way. So we're getting near the time and I can see a lot of really interesting comments in the chat. So thank you so much for all your comments. There can be a lot more questions coming up. Hopefully this is going to prompt further conversations amongst each other, amongst um, um, all of us. Um, before we conclude, and I would like Andreas to say a final word, but can I ask Michael and Sarah to give us one tip uh, to help the architects out there listening to you today as one thing. So, so my tip will be read the book because you'll find a lot of your answers are in there. Um, but can you give us one tip for architects? And then if I can then invite Andreas to conclude. Sarah, do you want to go first? short tip is to start um but i think you know our, our we haven't touched on it here uh, but we start the book with talking about reclaiming our agency as architects as designers and i think that that's what i would say you know especially for those who are who are studying right now um think when you when you're thinking about the role that you're training for out in the world don't just think of it as a passive recipient of briefs from a client, you know, actively think about how you can initiate change, how you can come together with your colleagues to initiate change and re yeah, reclaim your sense of agency and uh, reclaim your sense of po the possibility of uh, your, your ability to make a difference and contribute. And what I would encourage all architects to do and design and other designers as well is to think about where we ultimately need to get to. Because I think it's becoming increasingly clear that ultimately we have to find a way to integrate everything we do as humans into the web of life support systems on which we depend. And, and that's why this um, discipline that we're talking about um, is, is involves far more than just copying one or two nice shapes from nature. It's not about that at all. It's about actually, understanding the, the much deeper principles about how planet Earth evolved and how we can reintegrate ourselves into our home, our only home. And a home we share with billions of other species and uh, it's time we recognize that. Great, oh. and I put a few more links in the two other key references that might inspire people. And if I can ask Andreas to conclude. Yes, well, first of all, a, a big thank you. I, I guess the question I'm left with is uh, speaking to Forestry England and speaking to the research they're doing a lot seems to be around the resilient forest we need to plant now to withstand the climate crisis. And it touches upon Kate's point. On the one hand, the ecosystems we need to study is are in crisis and are changing in front of us, while at the same time, we have to have a long-term view. So it's, it's that dilemma I think a lot of students work will need to kind of address, I guess. But anyway, we're drawing it to a conclusion. I'm opening it up already. Uh, it's been really wonderful to have you both in CSM, even if it's digitally. I know, Michael, I saw you last in the bar. I hope we can welcome you in person soon and extend that conversation. And uh, thank you for everyone for being here. We have our next session in three weeks time uh, on offsetting. We've invited Argent, our landlord, who just bought 320 hectare of 
land in Scotland to grow a forest. So it's looking at that side of, of the debate and hopefully we kind of get a, a critical and fruitful kind of conversation going around that aspect. So it's good to know how we are as tenants also implicated in uh, rewilding projects in, in a distance. Uh, anyway, it's wonderful to have you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Carol, for being on time and for the wonderful Q&A. Thank you, Jessica and Joy for behind the scenes. Really appreciate it. We're trying to capture all these comments, put them on our website, so check in. And uh, we will let you know once we've published this talk online. Thank you. And thank you very much. Bye bye. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.